denoising your images. This is something we covered in episode 19, but there were some tweaks that occurred with the release of Darktable 2.6 back in December of 2018, which I have not as yet addressed. So, in this video, we will. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 45 of Understanding Darktable. I know I said I thought episode 44 would be the last episode that I'd get out the gate before I went on holiday. As luck would have it, I've found some time to sit down and do another one. So this will definitely be the last episode for at least a month whilst Kath and I head off to Sri Lanka. Okay, so noise. What changed? Well, specifically the module denoise profiled that changed and i'm not a hundred percent certain but i suspect that the raw denoise module may have also changed with the release of dark table 2.6 so let's just jump on in this is one image that i shot early this year probably within a week or two of me getting my a7 III and I think this was probably the first day that I, after I received my 15mm Lauer manual focus wide angle lens. So I just walked out in the forecourt area beside my garage and I shot an image of the Milky Way. Now, there's nothing spectacular about this image, but the reason I've chosen it is because if we zoom into 100%, and dive down here to this part of the image we've got a, a nice contrast between bright areas and deep shadow areas and as you can see there's quite a lot of color noise in this image so i thought this will be a good test image for what we're going to address in this particular video now i was going to dive straight into the denoise profiled module but in the process of just doing my research in preparation for recording this episode, I looked at the raw denoise module and realized that the thing that changed with the denoise profile module is also in the raw denoise module. And so that's why I say I'm not sure if this change happened to the raw denoise module as well. So I thought we'll address that first. And that particular change is the introduction of one of these graphs, which are very similar to the graph that you've seen in the equalizer module. Now, like I said, I definitely know that in Denoise Profiled, this graph did not exist in 2.4 and all of its dot releases. This only came to the Denoise Profile module with 2.6. But it's also in raw denoise as well. So let's just dive on in and have a look at what this does to our image and how we can use it. So what's raw denoise? Essentially, it's a denoising module which can be applied to raw images prior to demosaicing. Now, what's demosaicing? Well, that comes down to the way the sensor in a digital camera captures light. When we capture a raw file, I don't want to say an image because it's not actually an image, it's just a bucket full of data pertaining to how many photons of light existed for every pixel across the sensor. That data doesn't actually contain any color information. That's what the Bayer filter does, if you've ever heard that term, a Bayer filter. And if we look at the Wikipedia article on demosaicing, we scroll down, this is a Bayer arrangement here, and it's essentially divided into blocks of four, where there is one blue pixel, one red pixel, and two green pixels. And the reason there are two green pixels is because the human vision system, our, our eyes, and the way we perceive color, is less sensitive to the green part of the spectrum. And so that's why there are two greens for every one blue and one red. 
we are more sensitive to blue and red than we are to green. And this array is overlaid over the top of the sensor. And so what happens is when the photons of light come in, their intensity is filtered according to that part of the color spectrum that they fall into. This is all really technical, and I'm probably making a complete mess of the explanation, but just run with me here, okay? So as the photons of light come into the lens of the camera and are captured by the sensor, they're filtered according to the part of the light spectrum into which they fall by this Bayer filter. Now, when you want to then edit that raw image, a reversal process needs to take place. And that's what we refer to as demosaicing, where we choose to allow software, in this case Darktable, to do that demosaicing process for us rather than rely on the demosaicing algorithm that's built into our camera. If you shoot JPEG, you are essentially saying to the camera, you handle the demosaicing and I'll trust your judgment. When we shoot RAW and then bring those images into Darktable, sorry, I, I fell for it again, when we bring those files into Darktable, we then have more control over that demosaicing process, which is a very long way of getting around to saying that the RAW denoise module happens on the RAW data before the demosaicing has taken place. Now, why would you want to do that? That's outside of my pay grade. Well, that's above my pay grade, okay? I can't really answer that question for you, but at least understand that raw denoise occurs before the demosaicing has happened. And the way it works, according to the help manual for Darktable, is, well, first of all, we'll turn the raw denoise on. And straight away, we can see that it has done something to the noise in the image. It's improved it, but we can do better. Now, if you go to the help manual and read the section on raw denoise, it says, considering the R, G and B curves, the red, green and blue, the best way to use them is to look at one of the channels using the channel mixer module in gray mode. Denoise this particular channel and then do the same for the other channels. This way you can take into account the fact that some channels may be noisier than others into your denoising. Be aware that guessing which channel is noisy without actually seeing the channels individually is not straightforward and can be counterintuitive. A pixel which is completely red may not be caused by noise in the red channel, but actually by noise on the blue and green channels. Now, that's all well and good, but what the manual doesn't really go into detail on is how to use the channel mixer in grey mode for this particular approach to denoising. So let's have a look at that. We will turn the raw denoise module on, which I've now done, and we'll then jump over to the color group and activate the channel mixer. Now to save us having to jump back and forth, back and forth between the color group and the corrections group, I'll just jump over to the active modules tab and that way we've got our channel mixer and our raw denoise in the one column and we can just jump back and forth between them like so. All right, so we go to the channel mixer and we set this destination dropdown to gray. Now you'll notice that there is a red, green and a blue slider and by default they are all at zero. If we want to view just the red channel, we need to set this slider to a value of one. 
you'll notice that if we just click and drag, we start with an image that's almost black. And as we get to higher and higher values, we get to something that resembles our red channel. But we can go all the way to two, which over amplifies everything. So we just want a value of one. And the quickest way to get to that is to right click on the slider, type in one, hit enter, boom, done. So now we are just looking at the information contained in the red channel of our image. Now we can jump back to the raw denoise. And you will notice that on this graph, we have four buttons in the top left corner, all, R, G, and B. We don't want to look at all. All is looking at the red, green, and blue channels all at the same time. That's not what we want. We want to go to the red channel. And because we've set the channel mixer to only look at the red channel, we can now get real-time feedback as we adjust this graph. We can get feedback on what those changes are doing to just the red channel of the data. Okay, so as we can see, there is quite a lot of noise here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by cranking up the coarse end all the way to its maximum value. And yes, there was obviously some coarse noise in the red channel because we can see a bit of an improvement there already. Let's drag up this next one. And we can see that that is really starting to clean up the noise in this channel. Now, I'll go to the fine end. If I crank that all the way, I feel like that's maybe a little bit too aggressive. So I'm going to back that off a little bit. Might just bring this next. Yeah, I feel like that's getting to be a little bit too heavy handed now. Midtones. Yeah, we can see that there's stuff happening there. I might just back off the course end just a little bit. OK, so I think I'm in the right ballpark for the red channel. Now I want to move on to the green channel. But before I do that, I need to go back to the channel mixer. I've got to set the red channel back to zero, which brings all of the color information back. And now I've got to set my green channel to one. So now all we are seeing is the green channel. We're not seeing any of the data from the red channel or the blue channel. Now I can jump back to raw D noise and I can start tweaking the curve for the green channel. So again, I'm going to start bumping up the course values. And because I know there wasn't as much noise in the green channel, which when I say I know that, I'm just going on what I perceived with my eyes looking at the color version of this image. The green channel didn't appear to be as noisy as the red and the blue channel. And Full disclosure, you know, I need to take into account what the help manual said. You can't always guess this stuff. But I've sort of worked out that the green channel is not as noisy, so I'm just going to go with something like that. And that is already looking like an improvement to my eye. We'll do the blue channel, and then we'll have a look at the color image and see what we've ended up with. So... We jump over to the blue channel, but again, we've got to go back to the channel mixer, null the green channel to zero, and set the blue channel to one. Now we're just looking at the information contained in the blue channel of the data from our raw file. And as we can see, this has a lot of noise in it. You can see it all over the where the fence is at the bottom of this image. So we go back to our raw denoise, and I'm thinking we're probably going to have to be a little more aggressive here with the coarse noise in the blue channel. I'm not sure that there's a lot of fine... Well, there is a bit of fine noise there. And we'll just bring up some of that. Do we need to be a little more aggressive here? 
I don't want to get too heavy handed because I'm worried about what this is going to look like when we go back to our full color image. So, okay, so if I get a, oh, mate, actually, you know what? I'm going to reset that and I'm going to drag up. Oh, maybe it's that mid range that actually wants a little bit more. See that looks better and you know I've basically done an opposite curve to what I did for the red and the green channels but it looks to me just looking at the blue channel only that appears to have done a reasonable job of starting to sort out some of that noise okay so far so good let's now just turn the channel mixer off completely because that will immediately bring us back to our color image. And now I look at that and I go, wow, that's actually done a pretty good job. It's tackled a lot of the noise that was there. It's kept a reasonable amount of detail in the foliage in this palm tree and on the fence. And if I was to now just change this to a uniform blend mode, I can use this opacity slider to see a before and after. I mean, yes, I could use the on off switch for the module, uh, but this is just another way of doing it. So that's where the image started with zero opacity. We're essentially bypassing the module. So that's the noise that was there. You can see all this color noise that was on the fence here. And if we drag that back up to 100%, that's done a pretty good job. Pretty happy with that. So that's the raw D noise as it's applied prior to demosaicing. Now, I will confess, I don't know enough about the demosaicing algorithms to really understand how they do their thing and how they do it differently. So I'm not going to pretend to have a great handle on that but let's just turn this module off and let's go and have a look at the denoise profiled module now if you have not yet watched episode 19 one shame on you and two pause this video and go and watch it because a lot of the stuff that you need to know about denoising images in Darktable, I covered in that episode. And most of it I don't need to address a second time around. And because I covered a lot of stuff in that episode, I'm probably going to skip through some stuff right now because I don't need to cover it again. Okay, so as we can see, it's found a match for ISO 12800, which is the ISO that I shot this image at. And what's not made clear there is that that is not just a generic profile for 12,800 ISO for any camera. That is specific to my A7 III. Darktable has a database of over 200 cameras that have been profiled. So when you use Denoise Profiled, it's not just that ISO, it's that ISO for your specific camera. And there are two modes, non-local means and wavelets. And as I said in episode 19, and as it says in the help manual, this should always be used with a blend mode of lightness or HSV lightness. And if you are using the other mode, wavelets, that should be used with a blend mode of either color or HSV color. Now, with version 2.6 of Darktable, they included a couple of new presets, Chroma and Luma. And essentially, these include not only the appropriate mode, non-local means or wavelet, but they also include the blend modes already set up for you. So it suggests that you should do the Chroma first, so we will go with the Chroma preset. And as you can see, it's used all channels in one go. 
and it's really ramped up the attack on the chroma noise, that is the colour noise, at the fine end of the spectrum. And it has chosen a uniform blend using a colour blend mode. And again, we can use that opacity slider to see before and after. Are we happy with that? I guess so. Let's go to my second instance of the Denoise Profiled module. You already know how to instigate a new module. Let's change this to... Well, no, let's not change it. We'll just use the preset. So now we'll go to Luma and... What? Now, I just had to stop and do a little bit of reading because something caught me off guard. I thought that the Luma preset was going to use non-local means, but it actually doesn't. It uses the wavelets mode as well, but just in a lightness blend mode. I thought it was going to use non-local means and a lightness blend mode. So this is the Luma preset. And as we can see, we're in wavelets mode. Again, there is a graph that's already been defaulted for us. It's uniform blend in a lightness blend mode and with the opacity wound back to 70%. If we wind that up to 100%, we can see that it starts to lose a little bit of detail, particularly in the fence here. And I guess that's why someone decided that a 70% blend just brings back a little bit of that detail, but not bring back too much of the noise. So, that's the two denoise profiled presets as they stand. Is that a better result than the raw denoise? I don't know. That's entirely up to you. Once again, I think this is going to differ based on the image in question, what ISO you shot at, a whole bunch of variables. So it's essentially the introduction of that graph, that equalizer-like graph, to the denoise profiled module that was the major change between versions 2.4 and version 2.6 of Darktable. Again, I'm not sure if that was new for the raw denoise as well or whether raw denoise always had it. But hopefully that has just added a little bit to your arsenal of tools and techniques for addressing noise within your images in Darktable. The other thing to remember too is that according to the help manual, if it is a high ISO image that you are dealing with, then you should really look at the Denoise Bilateral Filter module because that particular module is designed for dealing with high ISO images. So we should probably do that before we sign off. So let's jump right back here to the white balance, go back to Bilateral Filter, and as you will recall from episode 19, because you have watched it, even if you hadn't until a few minutes ago, what we've got here is a radius control. And that essentially says, you know, how far and wide from any given pixel do I search for denoising? And we then have individual channels for red, green, and blue. So like so often is the case with Darktable, multiple ways to skin a cat. This is very similar to what you can now do in the other denoise modules with those individual red, green, and blue color channel buttons. It's just here we've got sliders for it. So we can turn the module on. Straight away, we can see it's done a fairly aggressive job of tackling the noise. But to my mind... It's lost a lot of detail in these shadow areas of the foliage here. So to me, I would probably dial the radius back. That brings back a little bit of that detail. It's brought back a little bit of the color noise. So again, 
It's a trade-off. Now, we do have to remember that we are looking at a 100% zoom view of this particular image. And my thinking is, unless you are going to print this image physically, like on paper or canvas or whatever, 100% view is probably overkill because you're not usually going to see a 100% view if you are only going to view the image on a digital display device, whether that's your computer monitor or your phone or your tablet or laptop or whatever. So I guess, you know, like I keep saying, it all comes down to your tolerance for noise in your images and it comes down to the image in question, you know, and that's, you know, how much noise is in those images is going to be dictated by how old is your camera. I mean, we, we've seen over the course of this series of videos the difference in noise between my, you know, now 10-year-old A850 versus my, you know, eight-month-old A7 III. Well, the A7 III was out for more than eight months, but it's just when I got mine. But, you know, the difference in those 10 years was phenomenal. You know, the amount of noise I'm seeing here from an A7 III at 12,800 ISO is about the same as what I would see from my A850 at 1600 ISO. Like, you know, the ability to deal with noise has come that far in 10 years. So, you know, all of these variables need to be taken into consideration as well as, like I said a minute ago, your own personal aesthetic. You know, what are you prepared to tolerate in terms of noise in your images? I can't answer that for you. You know, only you can answer that for you. Uh, everyone has a different tolerance. I will confess I'm pretty tolerant <laughs> of noise in images. And I think that's because I spent 10 years shooting with the A850, which I always knew, like even from the minute I got it, its ability to handle noise was pretty ordinary, in my opinion. Having said that, when I got my A850, I was coming from what was then a oh, four- or five-year-old Konica Minolta 7D. And the A850 seemed like as much an improvement over that old 7D as my A7 III now appears to be over the A850. You know, so all of these things have to be taken into consideration is essentially what I'm saying there. All right, people, hopefully that has now brought you up to speed on the latest with regards to the noise reduction tools in Darktable 2.6. No doubt four months from now when version 2.8 drops at Christmas time, who knows, there might be some new things in noise reduction processing that, you know, we can at this point in time only dream about. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. All right, that is going to do it. In terms of other stuff to talk about, like I said, uh, Kath and I are off on holiday as of next Saturday. It's Sunday as I'm recording this, uh, so a week away. And I will be gone for three weeks, and you know it'll probably be a good week or two after I get back before I will actually get to sit down and record another episode. So probably going to be at least a month to five weeks before we see another episode and my apologies for that but i needs a break okay uh don't think there's anything else to really address i think that's pretty much it so thank you once again for all of the subscribers on youtube thank you to my patreon supporters uh, there will be a link to my patreon in the description down below if you feel that what I do is valuable and you'd like to help, you know, keep me uh, fed and a roof over my head, then uh, feel free to head on over to Patreon and uh, pick a supporting level that you're comfortable with. And I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>